How how many of you have not heard of Superman? <laughs> oh, which planet are you from? <laughs> I'm sure we have heard of Superman. Okay, for the last eighty plus year, okay, Superman has been started with the comics, and now they are in the movies and uh, story. They have actually become the modern mythologies of our era. Okay, and we know that Superman, you know, is, is not human. He's an alien from the planet Krypton. <laughs> yeah, the, I mean, if you, the movie, you know, it feels like he's actually a somebody living somewhere. He's not real. But with the, because of the uh, sun's ray, it gives him superpower. The power, he has super strength, super intelligence, he has uh, x ray vision. It's quite useful, especially you now when in the hospital you have x ray vision. Free some of. So, there is a Superman verse in the Bible. Do you know that? Okay, so this is uh, interesting. Okay, I know that, uh, this morning I will spend some time examining this Superman verse. Of course, it's not called Superman verse. Okay, uh, it's something that uh, uh, I use, but it's not, there's no such thing as a Superman verse. Yeah, so don't go around putting Alex says uh, but Superman was <laughs> but I I'm glad that after you know preaching for so long, one of my passion is to get people to read the Bible. And, and I, I see that I know that in this church you all read the Bible. Praise the Lord. But the other thing is that we need to read the Bible and understand the Bible correctly. Okay? Because you can read the Bible and still go wrong. And that is a dangerous uh, part. Okay? And that's the thing that we have to be careful of. That we don't interpret the Bible. Because that will affect the way we think. That will affect the way we live. So, what is this Superman verse? Philippians 4.13 Okay, I mean, you know, in, in the uh, early days, you know, I could, when we have a Superman uh, comics, remember? Uh, or, or the cartoons, especially, I always remember the cartoons. Uh, it's faster than a, a moving locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings in Singapore. Okay. It's a bird. It's a man. It's Superman. I love watching all these cartoons when I was young. And now we have verse Philippians verse 30. I can do all things through him who strengthened me. Okay. And and we say, yeah, that's true. Okay. I can do all things through him who strengthened me. I can do all things. Yeah. And, and we tend to imply that we get some sort of superpower. Yeah. That we get extra intelligence, extra strength. Okay. Nobody asks that we can fly. But does that mean that we can also fly? I can do all things. Okay. King James Ocean says, I can do all things through Christ. Which strengthen me. And the New American Standard Bible says, I can do all things to him who strengthens me. I can do everything. I'm able to do all things to him who strengthens me. So the impression we have is that we, our natural abilities are, super, are given extra boost by Christ. Now, I think Christ can do that if he wants to. I, I don't think that uh, uh, Christ is not able to. Okay. But is that what the words really mean? I, I, I know we use these words a lot. I can do all things, especially when we are tired, we are weak, 
we are scared, you know, and then say, oh, I can do all things through Christ who's strength. But is that what the verse means? Let's look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 10 to 13. Okay. And as I read, see the flow, the flow of what Paul is writing. Paul is writing to the uh, Philippians. Okay. Paul's uh, set up a church in Philippians, most probably in the second missionary journey. So he is writing from prison. Okay, most probably from in Rome. Okay. And uh, he, he actually was in Rome twice. You know, he was in prison in Rome twice. The first one was uh, during a uh, house arrest. And the second one was before he was executed. And the first one, house arrest, not too bad because you are, you are, you are still living in a house, okay, even though you are chained to a soldier. The second one was the Mamantan prison, which is a cell, it's an underground cell. So if you go to Rome now, you can actually go to the, the Roman Forum and you can, they, there's a mark on the uh, floor says, below this is a Mamantan uh, prison. And it's not something you want to uh, spend your home stay there. Okay? It's not a stay situation because it's uh, very uncomfortable. So it is in this prison condition that Paul is writing to the Philippines. And Paul says that, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renew your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you have no opportunity to show it. And, and Paul was writing because uh, the Philippines didn't respond to him. He could have written an earlier letter or he could send word to Titus or Timothy, but they didn't respond to him. Then finally, the Philippines sent a gift. I said, for oh, that, getting a gift from a friend is great. Now, during the MCO, now I'm so happy, uh, grateful to all the church ladies who send me food. Okay, you know, for old men, you uh, you need food. Okay, and I thank them for their cooking. At least, quite good. So so Paul is you no, know, he received food from the Philippines, the Philippines. Okay, and, and uh, he's thankful for that. I'm not saying this because I'm in need. Now, he is in need, but I'm not saying he's in need. Oh, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. Every situation, whether well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or now, as you look, look at the apostles' uh, Paul's life, he most probably grew up in a rich family. They were able to send him to Jerusalem for education. Okay, and uh, uh, I visited Tarsus, and uh, apparently they showed me this the house of Paul and all that. Don't know whether it's real or not. So it's trap. But the the Jewish community is very rich in Tarsus. So Paul most of come from a very rich background, but as he uh, become a missionary, he, when you're a missionary, when you're traveling, then you're poor. But as he stays on in Ephesus for three years and become a tent maker, maybe he's rich. But Paul is saying that I've learned to be content, whether I'm rich or poor, I'm uh, hungry or not, I've learned to be content. And he's writing from prison. And then verse 13 says, I can do all this to him who gives me strength. So what is the context of this verse? Does it mean that we, we can be superheroes, we can have extra strength? 
But what is Paul really saying? Okay. One of the key words to uh, interpreting or understanding the Bible is looking at the words in context. Okay. We are very uh, commonly we will just take a word and say, oh, memorize this passage and claim this passage without understanding the context in which this passage comes about. So, is Paul saying that he can do all things? He can, he can super strength, he can uh, uh, have super abilities? What is Paul saying? Ben Witterton, Witterton, okay, is a New Testament scholar, well known. This is his translation of the passage. He says, I know a humble state, and I also know suffers in any and every situation. I have learned the secret of how to be satisfied or content, even if hungry, and being able to do without. And this is the Verse 13, I am able, strong enough to, en okay, to endure all things in him who empowers me. So it's not so much of what we can do through Christ who strengthens us, but how much we can endure through Christ who strengthens us. And that is what the, the verse uh, uh, 13 means, the Superman words. Endurance, not doing something out, but inwards. Eugene Peterson, when he translated the Bible, the message, he translated this, whatever I have, Wherever I am, I can make it through anything in the one who makes me. So it's, it's important to realize that the, the passage taken in this context have a different meaning altogether. <clears throat> it is to help us to endure. Okay, so if I have the power to face all such situations in union with the one who continuously infuses me with strength. So the message today is that whatever situation you are in, the pain that you bear, the grief and all this, Christ is with you. Christ will strengthen you to endure, to face all situations, so there is no fear. Okay, and to explain on that, uh, Ben says the words has something to do with I can accomplish anything with a little help from the Lord. Yes, we can use that. Uh, uh, we can believe that God will help us. I'm not saying that God doesn't help us. But if you are want to be true to the Word of God, if you want true to the Bible. The verse doesn't say that I can accomplish anything with a little help from the Lord. What the passage says is about perseverance in God's will and way. That means things that happen to you, what I now say. So how do we persevere? How do we uh, maintain that? How do we strong? How do we endure? It's not about personal success or triumph or even overcoming odds. Some kind. And it's not about God helping us to achieve our desires and goals. That's not Paul was saying. Paul was saying that all these things that happened to me, good and bad, 
rich and poor in need or are plentiful it's about Paul submitting to God's goals and plan and God giving him the strength to do so even when he must endure house arrest and hunger and deprivation. So let's move our mindset to that. Okay. It's not that God is with us. As we talk about the new heaven and earth, the is also and we can consider that new heaven and earth is also here. And God is with us. Even though we face pain and we face trouble. So you can see that there are a today. First is gratitude and community. That's why he says that, oh Philippines, thank you for, for giving me, sending me the gift. It's not so much of the gift, but the reason behind the gift. And if the people care enough, and I'm very grateful for people who, during the MCU, who will send me things, food, and uh, a grocery, and all these things. Okay. But what, what touches me is the people care enough to send me them, and people who are praying for me. And that's, I think Paul felt that gratitude and community. And Paul says that I have learned to be content. That's something that I need to learn too. And I'm clearly for us to learn too. Be content whether we are in one or whether we are in plentiful. To be balanced. So that we can persevere, endure. Okay, or long suffering through Christ. And that is the important part that we through Christ. Now Philip Yancy, I'm sure you are quite familiar to most of you. I first read his book, What's so amazing about grace? And uh, it's, it's fantastic. It tells about his background and then uh, how he discovered grace and how grace uh, uh, changed his life. And then he, he goes on to write on uh, write about other books. So so if if you want to start reading his books, the first book I want think I suggest is that uh, what's so amazing about grace. And then continue to write about where is God when he hurts. And uh, I find his book very honest. And I met him a few times. Okay, and uh, uh, I find that he's the most authentic uh, conference speaker I've met. He wrote Disappointment with God. Very honest about his doubts. About is there a God? And if there's a God, does the God care about us or not? Then he talk about church. Why bother? Why do we need to go to church? And the soul survival. And finding God in unexpected places. So, so this is a good author to read about finding grace. And then I read uh, recently his own autobiography, his memoirs. It was published last year. Where the light fell. And in it, he talks about very honestly and in depth about his own life. Okay, and uh, how he. Uh, And he gave a deep insight on his life that how did he come about? How did he come about that he can write books like not so amazing 
his uh, disappointment in God and all that. His family or his fa father and mother belong to the Christian fundamentalists. Okay. Christian fundamentalists are a very, uh, a very uh, strict form of uh, uh, Christianity. Okay, we are Presbyterians. We are belong to the Reformed tradition. Okay, so the Christian fundamentalists are actually more reformed than everybody else. They are the super reformers. They are so strict. Okay, you know it's like, you know we we are Presbyterian, then the Bible Presbyterian and the Reformed Bible Presbyterian. So they are very strict about everything. To them. Church is a place you must come. You can only go to church. You cannot go to cinema. You cannot read books. You cannot watch TV. The only book you may read is the Bible and only King James Version. And church, piano only, no drums. So very strict. They're the strict. They're the Pharisees of the uh, Protestants. You'll be surprised we still have fundamentalists uh, uh, even in JB. In, in near my house there's a church that's so fundamental that you know I, um, every Sunday morning they would wear coat and tie to go to worship. You know, so I can see them walking past my house wearing coat and tie. So they become very they are both the the father and mother of a place uh belong to this fundamental church in the southern part of America, what we call the Bible Belt. So they are southern fundamentalists, which is very, very strict. When they get married, both of them believe that they, they, they wanted the God caused them to be missionaries. So they want to be prepared to be missionaries and then the uh, become a pastor first. Now, while as a pastor, the father contracted polio. Okay, and at that time there was a polio epidemic. Polio epidemic as bad as our uh, uh, COVID. In 1916, and polio. Now we don't see polio the vaccine and people who, who contracted polio are not just children but more adults and for adults to get polio the polio affects the neurotransmitters of the muscles the the, the new uh, nerve that controls the muscles so people who contracted polio the muscles the breathing muscles are paralyzed so they cannot breathe so we have things like this is what they are called the iron lungs. We have to put the whole person in, and then the uh, iron lungs is actually create positive and negative pressure. So they suck up the pressure so that your lung can expand, and then they uh, increase the pressure so that it, it, you breathe in and out, breathe in and out. So it means you are using pressure inside this uh, medical cylinder. So can you imagine? spending your life not moving in an iron mark uh, and the only way you can see what is happening is a mirror on top okay because you cannot move your head some of them cannot move the head or you can move the head a bit so you can only know what is happening around you by looking at the mirror so the father was put into one of these iron lungs in a hospital and the father believed that God will heal him. So he asked the doctor, remove me from the iron lungs because God will heal me and I will breathe on my own. Well, let's see, they signed the forms and all that and uh, he was taken out of the iron lungs. And they were all waiting for God's healing. But then healing didn't come 
and he died three day, three hours later. But that's fundamental belief that God heals. Don't depend on medicine. So the father's death, leaving behind a young widow and two young children. Okay, and the mother has no uh, means of uh, support. But the, in, in uh, Gensi's uh, autobiography, he talks about that after the funeral and lay on the grave of the husband, okay, the fresh return of and she laid there and she says, now that we cannot be missionaries, like Hannah, we'll give our two sons to be missionaries for us. So in other words, she gave her children and that is one incident that was very clear in his memoirs because it affects the, the rest of the upbringing. The mother was preparing his two sons to be missionaries. So he was extra strict with them. He really controlled their life. You know, get up at what time, you know, and then spend in prayer, how long to pray, what to pray read the Bible and all that and, and get involved with it. And at that time, they are very poor because they depend on the husband, husband died. So the mother cannot find work. So they were so poor that for a large part of his uh, childhood, he actually lived in a trailer. Okay, the trailer is, is, is uh, like a Trailer is trailer. I think you know what it's trailer. Okay. Container. Views. So they were living in a trailer park, and then later on, the church, uh, uh, the church that they were attending, let them use a corner of their car park. So in the south, okay, they were living in a trailer, and people call them white trash because they are so poor that they are actually lowest okay but because they are white so they are actually higher than the blacks they are white trash and because of the uh, mother's strict upbringing for them to be a uh, missionary the sons rebel okay, in two different ways the older son becomes very rebellious, always doing everything the mother is against. Okay, until they will be fighting every day. While the younger son, Philip, withdraw into a shell. Okay, and and uh, hide in the shell, and that is the. The, the pain they go through when they are young. The older son is a, a very smart and a very musically inclined. So the mother sent them to a Christian college okay, and a, 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 a seminary. But the older son says, I want to transfer up to Wheaton College. Now, those of you who know, Wheaton College is actually a very respectable Protestant college. But the mother says, no, cannot go Wheaton. Wheaton is too liberal. Okay, but the son says, I want to go. And that's when uh, Yancy uh, noted another incident. The, the mother said, if you go I will curse you. And I ask God 
to help right, you lose your mind. It's like, what kind of mother will curse their son? Well, the older brother went to Britain. Unfortunately, like most children who come from a very repressed religious background, when they are alone, no parent, no parents supervising them, they go wild. Okay, and this is during the time of the hippies. So the son was involved in uh, free sex and new and not especially LSD. So he actually lost his mind. It meant that he had a mental breakdown and he was actually uh, confined. In the end, he lost his faith. Okay. His life is a mess. He has two failed marriages. Okay. So that is the young widow's curse. But Yuan Si survived all this through and managed later on to, as he moved away from the mother, to attend a college that his life changed and began to find grace. So you see that same family, same mother comes up differently. And I, I believe that that is where above all, Yancy says, grace is a gift. That he says, it's grace that saved him. That he can write all these books so now, after reading this biography, I begin to understand the depth of his pain and suffering that he went through. Coming out, he can write about what's so amazing about grace. Disappointment with God, church-wide border. Where is God? Finding God in unexpected places. I always like this passage, he notes, you know, he, he, he got one professor in this fundamental college, which is a very interesting professor. Uh, Yancy likes him. You know, I, I like him too, because every uh, week or every, every week, that every, every day actually, they will have all the students I attend. Then each the lectures will take, a professor will take turn. So when this professor's turn came, he came up to the club, uh, chapel and says, I've been waiting for the Lord the whole week for a verse to preach. Until today, the Lord didn't give me a verse. So class dismissed. I, I will tell you oh, very nice. One day I'll do it to you. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll say, hey, the Lord did give you rest. Okay, go back. <laughs> but the second, uh, the thing that I uh, I, I like is that he, he told Yancy. I mean, Yancy talked to him, Philip talked to him about his uh, disappointment with the church and his stress and all that. understand okay but then you need to develop receptors for grace i like the word receptors for grace you need to you know it, it's like i mean medicine you have the receptors so that you have the antibodies not the receptor to, to, to hang on to that okay so we need to develop receptors for grace in other words, he's trying to tell me and say that, yeah, your life is pain and suffering and all that, but it helps you to develop receptors for grace. So, maybe we, we have to learn to develop receptors for grace, and that will help us to be content in all things, whether we are in plenty or in one. 
Now this is a painting I think I showed you before, okay? Uh, by Ram, Rembrandt, the storms on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, Jesus was in the boat. Jesus is right here, okay? And then Jesus was sleeping when the storm came. And you can see that on this side of the painting, the the uh yeah the sailors were struggling. Well, this side is very calm. Okay, and you can see that uh, one of the sailors was vomiting, and this is actually Rembrandt. He painted himself into the, the thing. Okay, so the part, the calm of being Jesus who sustains us. To strengthen us. The adverse wind blows against my life. My little boat was with grief was tossed. My plans were gone. Heart full of strife. And all my hopes seems to be lost. Then he arose on word of peace. There was a calm. A sweet release. A tempest of great doubt and fear possessed my mind. No light was there, was there to guide or make my vision clear. Dark night is more than I could bear. Then I arose and saw his face. There was a calm filled with his grace. My heart was sinking me the wave of deepening tests and raging grief. All seems as lost and none could say. And nothing could bring me relief. Then he arose and spoke one word. There was a calm in his voice. God can strengthen you. We can all do great things. We can do all this through Him who gives us strength. So this is what Paul means. That God will strengthen us. Will help us to go through bad times. Or even good times. This is what Paul means. He doesn't mean that yeah. uh, power, superpower, is asking for extra strength to go through difficult times. As we look through our life, we, we know that about it. But during the bad times, know that God will give us strength. Until such time, we reach the new heaven and earth, where there will be no more tears and no more sorrow. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you for this time. This reminder to read your word faithfully and to understand your word correctly. Father, we know that you can strengthen us and do fantastic things. We have no doubt about it. But we want to understand what Paul meant when he wrote the letter. And now we know that Paul is not asking for superpowers. He's asking for strength to endure whatever suffering is going through. Especially as he knows his impending doom to be executed as he wrote that in the dungeon awaiting emperor 
and we know in history that he was actually beheaded by Emperor Nero. Father, we pray for all of us. Lord. Whatever situation we are, however much we are suffering, how, uh, you know. You know better than any of us. Whatever secret pain we are bearing, when we feel our weakness and inability to stand there. Father, thank you for this promise that you will strengthen us. That you, we can do all this, we can endure all things through you who give us strength. In Jesus' name, pray. Amen.